Um, <coughs> we wanted to talk to you today about um, some work we've been doing recently in, uh, in the public sector, um, and in particular using, uh, using machine learning and analytics to, uh, to reduce our risk. Uh, so just a quick outline of, the, uh, of what we're going to talk about. So I'll introduce um, the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, it turns out this essentially boils down to a, a uh, kind of fairly traditional fraud detection problem. So I'll go through um, uh, the kind of usual ways that you, uh, you approach those kind of problems. And then I'll, I'll show you how um, we, we twist, tweak it slightly to, to uh, work specifically for our case of, of trying to identify um, actually low risk uh, people and non-fraud effectively uh, as compared to, to fraud. And I'll go through the different steps that we go that we that we use in building our, our assurance scoring um, pipeline. But first, uh, who are we? So, uh, my name is Matt Thompson. I'm a senior data scientist at uh, Capgemini. I've been there for a couple of years now, um, and uh, I have kind of quite a few years of experience in working in fraud detection-like problems. Um, but I, I hail back to a, a PhD in astrophysics, uh, and uh, my my first shameless plug, you know, please cite my paper. It's linked there. Um, it's awesome. Natalia. Uh, my name is Natalia. I have a PhD in optical engineering. I worked a few years in academia in signal and image processing. And I joined Capgemini last year as a data scientist. All right. So we both work in the big data analytics team. Uh, we have something like... 30 or so data scientists at the moment, and something and around 40 big data engineers. Um, fair to say we're constantly growing, so that number is always changing. Uh, and we really focus on using open source uh, and big data technologies to, uh, and, and data science techniques to, to kind of help our, our clients solve their problems. Um, and we're proud to be a sponsor of the conference as well. So. All right, so just to, just to start off with a uh, a bit of an introduction to the to the problem that we're that we're trying to solve. Um, so the public sector is, is is working in a constant environment of trying to trying to do more with less, um, re reduced uh, reduced resources essentially. Um, populations are getting bigger, budgets are tight, and so you want to prov and you still want to provide a a better service, um, and so you need to do that with uh, with much greater efficiency. And so it's really important to make sure that your, the, the limited resources that you do have are focused in the right way. Um, and that's really what the, the kind of crux of this uh, assurance scoring uh, pipeline is. It's, um, it's, it's shifting the, the, uh, the resources that, uh, that are being expended on, um, uh, on, on cases that, and people that uh, present essentially no risk to, to, the, uh, to the public. Um, from from those low risk cases onto onto high risk uh, cases, and we and we've developed a method to use, uh, as I say, to use machine learning and other and other analytical techniques to to identify that least that least risk, risky um, part of the population. I realize that's all a bit abstract. Um, I wish I could tell you about specific examples, um, but I can't. So I've I've uh, we've kind of come up with a. Uh, a kind of hypothetical example of how we might apply this uh, this technique and this problem. <clears throat> so, so imagine that you're running the process of uh, the application process of selling tickets to the to the the 2016 Olympics in a few months' time. So, there are the, the tickets for for the Olympics are massively oversubscribed. There are many more um, many more people wanting tickets than there are. Uh, tickets available. So you you have an application process. You you know I'm I fill in a form. I'm Matt Thompson. I want ten tickets to go see the fencing, um, and I and I submit that application. And then it's the 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 kind of system has to uh, figure out who should get the tickets and who shouldn't get the tickets. Um, now the vast majority of people are uh, will be completely genuine, um, but there will be. But you want to avoid selling to tickets to um, to ticket touts. And ticket resellers. So, <coughs> um, so essentially, because they're so they're essentially the ticket touts and resellers that are, are are fraudulent people. They're people who want to make money from from reselling these tickets, um, and we we want to we want to avoid that. But we also want to avoid the approach of actually looking at each each individual application that people are uh, people are sending in. Um, 
so that essentially boils down to a, a kind of fairly classic fraud detection problem, uh, but with a very large class imbalance. We're, we're typically talking at less than kind of less than 0.1 percent of of fraudulent cases, uh, sometimes a lot less. Um, and so, and so, what we do is we say, okay, well, let's let's in, <laughs> instead of trying to trying to identify those very few uh, high risk, high fraudulent cases, actually, let's let's try and identify. Uh, a, a group, a larger group of very, very low risk, very non-fraudulent people. So people who are very unlikely to, um, to be a, a ticket tout or a ticket reseller. And if we can identify that group, that means we don't need to spend any resources or any money investigating that group, and they can be shifted onto the, uh, onto the, the higher risk group that are, that are more, um, uh, yeah, that are more risky. Um, so I just thought I'd give a quick a uh, quick reminder of the kind of traditional uh, fraud detection approach, um, which I'm hoping most of you are kind of fairly familiar with. This is the fairly, it's a fairly standard diagram of uh, applying a supervised machine learning um, profile. Um, so we, we start at the top, identify our, uh, our historical training data. That's, uh, that's going to be a, label, a set of um, labeled data with people who we who have committed fraud um, that we can train models on. We then have a, a kind of feature engineering step, so that's where we build our, we build our feature vector um, uh, for each of those people. So for each person who's applying for these, for these tickets, we will calculate variables um, for them, things like the number of tickets that they've applied for or the number of um, tickets they've bought in the past, something like that. You build your vector, and that's, I think, fair to say where you spend most of your time. Um, and then you go through a, a kind of model training and uh, evaluation step where uh, you, train your, you train your models um, and you identify uh, the model that gives you the best performance and you, and you can then deploy it into a, into a model execution step, um, which is where you, you can, for new applications coming in for these, for the, for these tickets, you can, you can predict whether or not they're going to be fraudulent or not. And there's a feedback process so that you can improve your models throughout. So that's and and as I said, so the traditional kind of approach is uh, we'll use this we'll use this method and we'll we'll really try and identify who's committing fraud. Um, and with assurance scoring, uh, we look to to focus on the people who are not committing fraud, um, and that allows our our resources to be better focused. Um, I'd also like to say it's not limited to machine learning. So machine learning is is kind of at its core, but what we can do is we can add a number of steps after the machine learning. Phase uh, to 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 really make sure that our low risk cases uh, really are low risk, um, and I'll talk through that uh, shortly. Um, all built using Python, of course, uh, and we're using the standard libraries, Pandas, Scikit-Learn, and, and so on. Um, okay, so so hopefully I'm, I'm just going to talk through this this diagram, which tries to explain the. The, the pipeline that we see for these cases. So imagine that um, imagine that you have a new batch of applications coming in from the from the left hand side here. You use a uh, we use a machine learning method to to classify those new applications for tickets into into high and low risk, and so that defines our initial high and low risk buckets. Um, we then, <coughs> I then see this as almost a, a kind of survival process. So we, we really interrogate that low risk bucket because we want to make sure that those cases really are low risk because we, we're not really going to do much investigation on them. So we can, so we look, we can use some kind of some deterministic rules, business rules to, uh, uh, to encode any additional logic that we want to that might push cases out of that low risk bucket into the high risk bucket. We can apply uh, statistical anomaly detection techniques uh, to identify batches of applications that uh, that we might not want to consider uh, low risk. We can then look for um, what we call graph traversal. It's essentially looking for links between um, that, that high risk bucket and any previous, sorry, that low risk bucket and any previous high risk cases. So um, and and uh, and so anyone that's <coughs> Any low risk person that is linked to a high risk person, you might want to kick out of that low risk bucket and put into the high risk cases. And so the idea is that if your low risk um, 
bucket has been classified as low risk by a machine learning model, has passed your rules, passed your uh, anomaly detection, passed your, your linking questions, um, you can be pretty sure that your, the final bucket that you've got really is uh, low risk. And so the rest of this talk will be um, essentially taking you through each of those different steps. Before we, yeah, but before we do that, and before we do any kind of machine learning or analytics, uh, we need data. Um, so, uh, and one of the things that we found really useful is to, um, is to apply a, an, an analytical data model, um, which we call the, the poll model. Um, I don't know, has anyone come across this? No, okay. Um, so a lot of organizations, uh, <clears throat> big organizations have a real problem with a lot of different data sources spread across um, different silos, different departments. Um, and uh, and <clears throat> the, key, the key thing that we do is we want to bring all that data together. So these data sources, are, so imagine these are, these are all data sources at the bottom. Um, it might be an Oracle database, it might be a SQL Server database, it might be a, it might be a set of CSV files, it might be Twitter data that you want to bring in. Um, and you want to bring all those, all those different data sources together into a single place. <clears throat> and that's what we've got at the bottom here, and that's great, that's really useful, but it can still be quite difficult to, to kind of identify the links between those different data sources. Um, and also, if we, if we start adding more data sources, it, it kind of gets, uh, it, it gets in, you know, it get, gets more complicated as you add additional data sources. And so what we do instead is we say, well, actually, we're only, we're interested in, in particular attributes within, within these disparate data sources. Um, and so we define this, uh, this, this analytical data layer on top of our um, data warehouse, essentially, uh, which, is the, which is the poll model. So poll stands for person, object, location, uh, and event. And essentially what we do is we go through each of these different data sources and we pick out anything that looks like a person and we promote it into the person table. This is basically just a table in the database. We go through anything that looks like a location and we put it in the location table. Anything that looks like event goes in the event table. Um, so for our example, you know, a person is, a per is someone applying for tickets to the Olympics. Uh, the a location might be the address that they're applying from. Um, event might be the actual, the actual application itself, um, and so on. Uh, and the, the kind of benefit of this is that um, if you add more, more data sources, um, the complexity stays the same. So you can do your data science all on top of this poll model, um, and you don't need to worry about all your, your, any extra data sources too much. Um, and there's always one thing that's, uh, that's missed off those, those kind of slides uh, around the poll model, and that is the relationships between, between the entities. So there's a relationships table that defines the relationships between party and uh, between people and events, um, and between people or parties and, uh, and location. Uh, okay, so now we've got our now we've got our data. Um, it's time to do some to, to start building our assurance scoring pipeline. <coughs> and we start off with uh, the machine learning element. So machine learning is at its uh, is the it's really the core of the uh, core of the model, um, or core of the pipeline rather. Uh, and then, and Natalia is going to take you through uh, how we build that. Thank you very much. So we've got our machine learning part. So we want to build a classifier. So we want to be able to put these, class these applications into the low risk buckets or into the high risk buckets. And we've built this framework in Python. So the idea was to incorporate, of course, scikit-learn for the model building, pandas for data exploration. But we also wanted to have some built-in functions that, that we could easily explore and test techniques, and we could understand and know what will work and what it wouldn't. Um, so the idea of the framework is that we have some structure. So as I said before, we can compare what it works and what it doesn't. And, but it has some flexibility, so we can target our code and our functions according to the data set that we are working with. We all know that we need to do some data pre-processing to our data sets, depending on, on the problem at hand. So we've done that. But what we didn't want was a framework that would actually, with the click of a button, will give you a model. 
You know, we wanted the person or the data scientist rather, you know, to be there to um, specify the parameters of the model to have control at every stage of what was going on. But the other feature that we wanted was consistency. So it doesn't matter which data sources I'm reading my data from, doesn't matter what data preprocessing I need to do, what we want is that at the end of the day, I've got my set of outputs, it could be my models, we can have pickle models, I have log files, for example, so we can replicate and we can understand what happened when we were building a model. So we wanted to have all these outputs and this consistency across our framework. Uh, of course, we did uh, all the testing with it, so unit testing, we have some monitoring testing, and this is quite important, you know, with your data, we kind of know what ranges you are expecting, so it's good to have these checks. So we say, okay, we've got this column, are we, are we in range? Are we the, uh, is the data as I, as I expected? And we know this is knowledge from the business. This is all the contingency plan just to make sure that all your data flow is going as it should be within this machine learning pipeline. So let's go into the feature engineering. So we've got all this data and let's come back to our Olympics example. So we want to, we, we, if we, let's say we want to score all the people applying for tickets on the 2016, but we are gonna use the 2012 Olympics data as our training data. So we already know which people have actually been resellers. So we have all this data and what we want now is to be able to identify what bits of information are most relevant for this classification problem. And uh, we tend to spend a lot of time on this part, really. So the idea is that we've got all this historical data, oh, sorry, this historical data, and we are gonna transform. And the best advice here, and it's something that we do uh, with our clients, is actually try to incorporate the business knowledge and the field expertise into this process. So we want to map, for example, something that is happening in real life, you know, this is a business process and we are trying to extract a feature, a variable that will represent this actual process. And I don't know, probably you are aware of this and feature engineering sometimes is, is known as, as an art. And I believe this is true, you know, this is an opportunity for us as data scientists to incorporate uh, perhaps novel analytical techniques. Sometimes we've used text analytics or sentiment analysis, we've tried network analytics, you know, and trying to incorporate new variables and new features into, into our models. Um, we do this in, a, in an iterative process and we kind of need to to know our data and something that you may be aware of is that you need the strategies to actually deal with outliers, for example, how to deal with the null values and all this. And we have implemented all these functions within our framework so we can easily standardize our data and clean our data. Um, of course, we, the idea is to build as many features as possible, but we all know that if we want our model to be able to generalize well, with, uh, with new data, we need to select some of these features and we need to identify the most relevant features. And for example, scikit-learn has some um, good tests to assess the significance of some of the features. You can run a uh, decision tree or perhaps a random forest and then you see the feature importance. So in this way, you can pre-select some of the features. It is very important and this happens a lot. We always validate the features we are selecting with the product owners or with the people in the business. So we are sure that we are integrating all that knowledge. And it's always good to ask questions, you know, always question your data. Is it really representing what is going on? Is it really generalizing your population? And remember this, we don't want our model to perform well on the data they have been trained for. So we don't want it to get all the 20, 12 uh, resellers, we want to be able to identify the new ones coming on the 2016. So after we've done this uh, first step with the feature selection, we go into the model building, standard things, we use cross-validation, we do this in an iterative process, we have our training data set, we divide it in three, we go, we use some part for training, some part from validation, but something that we find that is, is, is good practice is to have a holdout test. And this is a segment of your training data that you do not use for either feature extraction or to train your model. And the idea is that then you can test and assess your models on this new data set. And we, with the idea of seeing how well your model is gonna generalize on new data. Um, within our framework, 
we test different models and we use, uh, for example, grid search for hyperparameter tuning and we use all the features built in scikit-learn. And um, once we've got a set of models that we are happy with, we go and try to select the best one. And which one is the best model? It's, it's the million dollar question, isn't it? And, and it really depends on the, on the application that we are working with. Um, something that is very important is to understand how the output of the model is gonna be used. In our case, we have a score for each of the applications, and we most likely the business process is gonna be to set a threshold in a way that the cases that are below certain score are considered to be low risk, so they, they go to a different processing uh, center, let's say, and so they are gonna be, uh, they don't need to be looked into details, but then we'll have the high risk buckets where probably you want to understand more what is happening. Um, how do you set a threshold for a classifier? Again, it's very application dependent. Sometimes we want to make sure that the cases we put in the high risk bucket are really high risk. And this is called that we have a high precision. But sometimes you don't mind if you have one of these green or low risk cases into your red bucket, as long as you have as many as you can of the high risk. So then you set your threshold lower. So again, it's very case dependent. And what we've done here is we've got our buckets. So we say, okay, let's set a threshold here. And we've got the business agreeing on this. And then we say, okay, let's put our bucket here and our other bucket here. And then we apply further analytical techniques to ensure that actually the cases that are on this low risk bucket are really low risk. And this is what Matt is gonna tell us a bit more about. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so thanks Natalia. So, so you've finished your, you've trained your, you've trained your machine learning model. You've got your, you've got your classifier up and running. Um, we're now going to start building some of the extra, extra parts of the pipeline. Um, so, and the first one is, uh, is looking at essentially deterministic rules. Um, relatively simple, I appreciate, but um, uh, actually how a lot, how a lot of um, fraud detection in the past has been done in this way, and it allows you to. Uh, often get buy-in from, from clients in order to, um, to help your machine learning um, classifier so that you're not just using a, a, a machine learning classifier. Um, so the particular example uh, that I was going to use here is, is that um, when you're looking for, looking for transactions near a threshold, so, uh, and this is a, a kind of classic fraud detection problem in, in accounting. Um, so I... I uh, Imagine a, an expenses system. So, uh, you know, I'm Matt Thompson. I'm staying at a hotel tonight. I'm going to submit an expense, an expense uh, claim for that for that cost. Um, a lot of the time, within expenses systems, uh, you would look at um, transactions above a particular threshold in more in more detail. You give them more scrutiny. And so, what a fraudster can do is say, well, actually, um, if my threshold is 100 pounds, I'm going to put a whole load of transactions through at 90 pounds because I know that they're not going to get scrutinized and I can, I can get away with my, my fraudulent expense claim. So what you might want to do is, is uh, encode, and so you know, you, we know that behavior, and so we can encode that behavior directly, uh, um, you know, explicitly, and that can be really helpful to, um, uh, to, help, our, to help define that low-risk bucket. Um, and in, in the Olympics example, uh, so, so I was going to say, so this, <coughs> this tends to end up being uh, kind of queries on your feature vector. So you've, we've built the feature vector. We might as well use it um, to do more than just our, our machine learning. Um, and so we might want to say that anyone applying for more than £10,000 worth of, worth of tickets, we're going to want to investigate in more detail, um, regardless of what the machine learning model says. Uh, okay, so the next next step on this uh, in the pipeline is the uh, statistical anomaly detection. So, I'm afraid I've, so I've got a really a kind of toy example here for for what I mean by that. Um, but essentially, you can use the training data to create a, a historical baseline of, say, applications um, within a within a time window. So, applications per per day, per month, per week, um, within a particular postcode. You use that to to define your baseline. And then if, <clears throat> if you get a set of applications or a batch of applications from a particular postcode um, or, uh, or county or something that is way off the charts compared to what you would, what you would normally expect, you might actually want to push all of those uh, cases from that low-risk bucket into that high-risk bucket. Okay, so we're nearly there. Um, 
So the, 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 the kind of final step that uh, we're going to go through today is the, the kind of uh, what we call the graph traversal. And so essentially there, we've got our low-risk bucket, we've got our high-risk bucket, and we want to see if there's any way we can link a high-risk case to, uh, sorry, a low-risk case to a, to a, to a high-risk case. Because if, if we can find a link, we're going to push that case out from our low-risk into our high-risk. And we use a matching, uh, a probabilistic matching approach um, to do that. Um, and it's actually quite a key part of our um, assurance scoring uh, pipeline is, is, as I said at the start, bringing those disparate data sources together. Um, and so imagine the scenario that you've got, uh, I've got two data sources here, um, each with three attributes, uh, name, phone number, and, uh, and favorite sport. Um, and <coughs> imagine that the, the entity, if you like, in data source one has been, has, has been classed as, as high risk. The entity in, in data source two has been classed as low risk. Um, we, then, we then apply this probabilistic match and we say, well, actually, the names are fairly similar. There's a bit of a misspelling. The, the numbers are, the phone numbers are basically the same. There's just the last two digits have been switched. And OK, the favorite sport's completely different, but uh, maybe we don't care about that. And so you might say, <coughs> so imagine this is a, a, a match of, say, 80%. And again, because we're, because we're really interested in, uh, in identifying a pure low-risk um, uh, low bucket, we're quite happy to accept a, a kind of low threshold for this matching. So we're quite happy to say, well, they might not actually be the same, um, but we're going to push, the, push them out anyway. Um, and we, we find that a really valuable uh, way to, uh, to bring different data sources together. Okay, and so then we've got our, so then we've, we've got our pipeline. So we've, we've built our machine learning model. We've applied our we've applied our rules. Uh, we've built our anomaly detection. We've built our links between the high risk bucket and the low risk bucket. And so the idea is that any any low risk cases that have got through all of those steps unscathed, um, you know, we can really we can really say are, are low risk. Yeah. Um, if you are, if you want more details, we feel free to get in touch with me. Um, we also have published recently an assurance scoring brochure, which kind of goes through all the details uh, that I've just talked about. Um, we're also in the middle of a blog campaign, um, so we've got a, f a few blogs um, published already. Again, just going into more details around all of this, uh, and more are coming soon. Uh, and that's it. <clears throat> I have two questions. Uh, do you find yourself looking at contributions behind features for a particular prediction often? Sorry? Sorry, say that again? Do you find yourself looking at contributions for a particular prediction often in order to explain why oh, that prediction um, was made and how you approach this? And second one, how do you ensure replicability of all the models you build? So, if, if you do. <laughs> uh, yeah, so... Um, so replicabil replicability, uh, I, I mean, I, I guess I hope that our, um, well, so, so we're, we're building the model on a, on a single training set. So, um, you know, so it's, it's historical, it's a single set of historical data. Uh, um, we, I mean, we apply the kind of cross-validation kind of methods. Is that what you're, is that what you're getting at? Or I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what you mean exactly, but. We essentially use cross-validation to, to ensure that our, and, and our test set that Natalia was talking, uh, talking about earlier to make sure that our, our models generalize and, and that kind of thing. Um, I may add something there. For example, we are lucky that we have a lot of data, so we are they rich in data. So, for example, what we've done also is test, for example, on 2014 data. We also test some features on the 2015 data, you know, so we see that there are maybe perhaps if there are variations in times that actually the features are relevant, you know, at different points in time. So we've also done that to ensure that actually our models and our features are representing the best, the data and the problem at hand. So that's another. And in answer to your first question around the contribution, yeah, we do look at that. I think it's fair to say we probably do it relatively simply at the moment, kind of just standard kind of chi-square type stuff. Could you say something about how you assign probabilities, match probabilities, during the graph traversals step? <laughs> uh, so uh, that's it's a bit tricky. We actually use a we actually use a um, a product to do that. Um, so 
Uh, I'm, not, I'm not the expert on, uh, on how that works, so uh, I'd, I'd, uh, I, I, if, if you grab me offline, I can, I can point you into the right direction. Uh, hi, yeah, um, I was just curious, because I mean, obviously you can't go into specifics for obvious reasons, but uh, you focus on a sp the example of a specific service for risk models, whereas I actually work in the public sector and uh, a lot of different services might have the same risk profiles for the mm -hmm. people rather than the service that, you actually yeah. that you're, you're purchasing for. So, I mean, how much do you think the approach that you've taken is applicable to other public sector services beyond a specific one that you have trained your data on? Yeah. So <clears throat> I think it's I think it's really really applicable to a number of different areas, and we've so we we've, we've built it. You're right for a specific example, but we've um, we've built it in such a way that we could we could apply it to all kinds of different uh, uh, different use cases. I think it's I think it's very ge general. It, it's it's trying to solve a problem that it, it generally exists within within public sector systems. Uh, since uh, fraud detection is quite an adversarial thing, uh, you detect people and then people learn, how often will your model go out of date? How much does retraining? <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cost? much out of date as soon as you, as soon as you, uh, as soon as you train it. Um, so, you, you, yeah, you have to keep on top of that. You have to, to regularly refresh your, your models and your, um, uh, and your pipeline. Um, then there's not much you can do about that. Um, that's just the way it is. Is that a significant cost or are you always lagging behind? Uh, it's a significant cost. How do you mean? This? I mean, this so if it takes like a week to train it, you can. So see it doesn't. Oh no. So it doesn't take that. We, well, so it ta it takes time. Yeah, it, um, of course. But um, it's not. Once once you've got the kind of framework in place, tweaking it is relatively simple. Right. Um, so you mentioned that. Um, sorry, sorry, <laughs> I couldn't see you. Yeah. So you mentioned. Uh, your graph uh, is graph database. So yeah. w what's the reason for that um, as opposed to in-memory type graph, for example? As opposed to? In-memory type graphs uh, that you oh, okay. train live. Uh, I, I guess because, so <coughs> uh, we have a lot of data. So um, we, uh, and we, we use Neo4j uh, in particular because it's really good at fa for fast querying. Um, when we want to do things like network analytics, we'd probably move to, to more of a um, the Spark right. Uh, graph. Right. Good. And are those um, in the in the pipeline? Do, do you do you um, train the pipeline all at once, or you you do that independently? For example, I appreciate that the graph might take a while to actually train. How often do you do that? Uh, so we, we I guess we build it in steps, but we have to we have to we also have to. Um, Make sure that we, we train end to end so that we're not uh, uh, you know biasing our results too much. Right. Thank you. Okay. If there are no more questions, thank you very much, Matt and Natalia. Thank you.